Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to our workshop in Global Health and Planetary Health Perspectives for a Transition to a More Sustainable World. My name is Gabriela Di Giulio, and it's a great pleasure to be here in such great companies, to talk here and learn critical perspectives and analysis regarding the interactions between the academic and practical fields of global health and planetary health. First of all, I'd like to thank to my colleagues, Helena Ribeiro, Denzi Veitura, who coordinate our postgrad program, Global Health and Sustainability at the University of Sao Paulo, and helped me to propose this workshop and organize this workshop. My sincere thanks to the speakers who kindly accepted our invitation to be here. We are grateful to the organizers for this wonderful Planetary Health Annual Meeting Festival and for accepting our proposal for this side event. Many thanks for the inclined support for hosting this workshop and broadcast on YouTube. A big thanks to Teresa Ambrisi, Livia and Richard. And last but not least, I'd like to express my gratitude for all of you who are here with us participating in this virtual workshop. This is a very challenging time and I do hope you are safe health and dealing well with these challenges. I also hope you have two great hours of discussions and reflections on viable paths to promote changes for a more sustainable, equitable and adaptive future. The idea of this workshop came up in a moment when the COVID-19 pandemic, climate emergence, loss of biodiversity and other global crises are affecting us and our lives in so many different ways. There is no doubt that we, human beings, are responsible for this crisis. The emergence of risks and uncertainties on the basis of this crisis is closely related to the development process, accelerated globalization, technological advances, rampant deforestation. This crisis and their effects have clearly shown the complexity of our responses and it clearly suggests the need for a reorientation of values and a reorganization of power and responsibilities. This crisis exposed the existing disputes over different conceptions of society, ways of life, and development models. However, this crisis also might be seen as opportunities to catalyze the process of social change as real time experiments in downsizing the consumer economy and accelerate transformations. The crucial questions here are, as a collective, do you really want to do that? Are we ready for these changes? Do we have the conditions to push this transformative agenda? Are we aware that we must tackle these planetary challenges brought by the Anthropocene? The global health field sheds light on critical aspects regarding these questions. First of all, as the researchers Paulo Fortes and Elena Ribeiro mentioned in their paper, Global Health in Globalization Times, global health can be understood at the same time as a condition, an activity, a profession, a philosophy, a discipline, and a movement. Global health encompasses knowledge, teaching, practice, research regarding extraterritorial health issues and problems that exceed the national geographical boundaries, their social and environmental determinants and possible solutions that require interventions, agreement among different stakeholders, including countries, governments, international public and private institutions. So this comprehension clarifies the main research areas and the impacts of global health. First of all, the unequal distribution of diseases around the world, the impacts of global environmental changes on human health, mitigation and adaptation, and the global health policy institutions and systems. As you will see in our workshop, from a critical perspective of global health, our research efforts focus on the interdependency between health, economic development, environmental degradation, governance, and human rights. As we endorse in the, in the recent paper about the challenges for a Brazilian research agenda in global health and sustainability, the literature on the relationship between global health and the Anthropocene clear identifies the limits of technological solutions to respond to this global crisis. 
That's the reason why we must better understand the interactions between regulatory frameworks, decision-making process, collective actions, and individual perspectives to cope with the global crisis. Now, I invite Elena Ribeiro to introduce our speakers and the dynamic of the workshop. Thank you. Os botõezinhos ficam um ao lado do outro, né? Eu acho que é por isso. Eu não estava conseguindo abrir o microfone. Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, I would like to present our speakers. The first one is Paulo Marchiori Bus. Uh, he's a medical doctor, PhD in science from University of São Paulo, emeritus professor of Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, and he represented Brazil in the last 15 World Health Assembly. He's the dean of the Centro de Relações Internacionais of Fiocruz, and he's going to talk about Agenda 2030. Uh, João Nunes is a PhD in political science. He's a professor at the Department of Politics from University of War, York in England. And he's going to talk about securitization, global health and planetary health. Teresa Campelo is an economist. She's visiting professor at the School of Public Health of the University of Sao Paulo in the chair Josué de Castro. She's former Minister of Social Development and Fight Against Hunger of Brazil. And she's going to talk about a healthy and sustainable food system. Patricia Jaime is a nutritionist. She's PhD in public health and postdoc in food and nutrition at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she's full professor at the Nutrition Department of the School of Public Health of the University of Sao Paulo. And she's going to talk about public policies for food security. Gabriela Di Giulio, she's Bachelor in Social Communication and PhD in Environmental and Society from Unicamp. She's Associate Professor at the Department of Environmental Health of the School of Public Health. And she's going to talk about climate crisis and transition for sustainability. And he, Elena Ribeiro, myself, I'm a geographer, a PhD in physical geography, and postdoc in environmental management at the École Internationale d'Environnement in Switzerland. I'm a full professor at the Environmental Health Department of the School of Public Health. And I'm going to talk about nature-based solutions and green infrastructure as health benefits. And now I pass the word to Paulo Bus, and I thank you for your participation in this workshop. Uh, thank you so much, Elena. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, initially, I, I would like to thank for the invitation to speak uh, at this important meeting on plenary health and global health and, and sharing the floor with such competent colleagues and I can say old friends. I confess that uh, it's very difficult to talk about uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its uh, Sustainable Development Goals in such a, a short time but let's try. The important is the goodwill. So I really uh, let's try uh, go uh, in, in, in the issue, uh, believing that it's possible to say some uh, at least intelligent things about this question in a short time. First, uh, let me remind uh, some landmarks of the Agenda 2030 history in the last 30 years. I can say that the deep roots of Agenda 
30 are initially at the Earth Summit, the Rio 92, which defines and seeks to establish the commitment of governments and society to Agenda 21. The Agenda 21, as you know, is a set of proposals and actions that should guide a development model that would not compromise the development of future generations, a concept uh, with roots in Stockholm, the first uh, uh, summit of uh, the Earth Summit in Stockholm, and after the developments of this concept by uh, a, a lot of uh, institutions and politicians and the United, the United Nations. In the 90s, the United Nations development agenda took shape with a cycle of major United Nations semantic conferences on the many dimensions of development to brackets, prepare the world for the 21st century. I remember some of these, uh, these um, major uh, conferences like the Summit of Children, uh, the Food, the Human Rights, uh, the, the social development in Copenhagen, women uh, in Beijing, uh, reproductive health uh, in uh, Cairo, etc., etc., etc. In the 20s, in the 2000s, at the Millennium Summit, the very known age Millennium Development Goals are defined to be achieved by 2050, as you remember. Uh, the relative success in achieving the goals agreed for the MDGs stimulated the United Nations and its member states to maintain this strategy of consensual global and national development goals. This consensual global and the national development goals. This was a, a strategy defined by, um, by the, uh, the United Nations in New York. As of uh, 2010, have begun the discussions on expanding the scope of the United Nations Development Program beyond the eight modest Millennium Development Goals. The striking deepening of the environmental crisis and the growing pressure from civil society led the United Nations and, and its member states to deepen the Sustainable Development Strategy, the Sustainable Development Strategy, which appears to occupy the agenda of various UN agencies, programs, and funds, and eventually some state member states members, like Brazil. Brazil was a very important uh, in, the, in this process of uh, uh, building uh, this new agenda of social uh, of the. Uh, uh, sustainable development. Simultaneously, various NGOs, the civil society, the social movements focusing in social, economic, and environmental development appear or are enforced in the global and national scenarios. And this was very important. The raising of the social movements, uh, discussing positions, questioning the, the, the governments about the, the a very important social economic, but uh, all, uh, uh, the, the, the environmental crisis, it was a very important focus of uh, the social movement. And the government uh, should move uh, to, uh, to face this, this, uh, this very important movement. So in this context, the United Nations Summit on Sustainable Development, the Hill Plus 20, takes place in 20. 12, which points out to a process and a set of goals that would replace the MDGs. This new set of goals, more ambitious and with a much more participatory construction, should be developed for adoption at the United Nations Assembly and be effective until 2030. Upon completing 70 years in 2015, in its 7th General Assembly, member states adopted the resolution A70.1, 
which establishes the agenda, the 2030 agenda and its 17 SDGs. The process of financing the, the, this kind of development was defined in the action agenda of Addis Ababa, as you remember, and is part of the mentioned resolution, uh, the 70.1 uh, from uh, 2015. The process of monitoring the implementation of Agenda 2030, it's uh, 17 SDGs, this 69 goals and 230 indicators, this very complex process, as well as its financing, is done globally by the High Level Political Forum, held each four years at the United Nations General Assembly and annually at meetings of the UN Economic and Social Council, like in next June, the fifth uh, meeting of the, the High Level Political Forum at the level of the UN Economic and Social Council. The several annual reports about the development of the Agenda 2030 and its SDG since 2016 have shown only partial achievement of the most SDGs. Among other uh, very important reasons, uh, for the poor performance of the developed countries, the developed countries' commitment to financing for development. This was a very important dimension of this only partial achievement of the most uh, SDGs. And despite the commitment to implement a sustainable, equitable, and inclusive development model, let us remember here the slogan, leave no one behind, assumed in 2015, what has been observed is actually the permanence of a non-sustainable model of development. Because inequalities have been accentuated globally and regionally, as well as within most countries. Poverty and inequality have been on the rise since 2017 in Latin America, for instance. Uh, the unsustainable exploitation of land, water, forests, oceans, and the prevalence of unhealthy cities, let me say, show how profound is the environmental crisis. The emergence of the pandemic in the beginning of 2020 only added the difficulties to pro the process of global development and in all countries of the world. Economies have been paralyzed, as you know. The prospects for recovery have been postponed and postponed. Hunger and food insecurity are increasing. And the pandemic has not only highlighted the many social, economic, and the environmental problems, but also amplified them amplified these social, many social, economic, and environmental problems. The emergence of the virus itself is the result of profound environmental aggressions, the sustainable exploitation of forest resources, and the loss of biodiversity. So uh, the, 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 the emergence of the virus and the disease and the pandemic comes from this environmental crisis. We know this one. And the obscene episode of vaccine nationalism reveals the contradiction between the myself first from the developed countries and the leaving no one behind, now seen only rhetorically assumed by many countries in 2050. And despite this devastating assessment of the global commitment to the 2030 Agenda and the bigger compliance with the SDGs, we are now seeing most heads of United Nations agencies, such as the Secretary General Antonio Guterres, the WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, and in Latin America, the director of ICLAC, the Economic uh, and Social Latin American Commission and, and, and Caribbean Commission, Alicia Barcenas, and the director of PAHO, Carissa Etienne, as well many representatives of uh, some important multilateral arrangements have emphatically reaffirmed 
that the social, economic, and the environmental recovery is possible only through the 2030 Agenda and, it, and its SDGs. It's controversial, it's paradoxical, but it is the, 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 the issue. And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, but disappointingly, uh, it has been the noisy silence of the leaders of the international financial institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, regarding the 2030 Agenda and its SDGs now. But they are talking about recovering better, but not with using the concept and the, the strategies of uh, a sustainable development. It's more uh, particularly uh, situations, particular interventions, but not seeing this. They are living. They are. They are seeing the the, the trees, not the forest. That is the question. Uh, some uh, particular interventions, etc. Um, but we can say that uh, therefore many world leaders, leaders of many United Nations, as I mentioned, and important global social movements recognize the difficulties in achieving the SDG, but they also recognize that it's essential to revitalize the commitment to Agenda 2030 as the best way out of the great crisis produced by the pandemic. And to this end, it's essential to revitalize and strengthen global multilateralism, in my opinion, as in the case the, with the United Nations and its agencies, and particularly in Latin America, to reconstruct multilateralism that was destroyed by conservative governments that took, pair, took power in key countries in the region, like here in Brazil, with uh, uh, Bolsonaro's uh, government. So these, these are my conclusions and contributions to our debate. And these conclusions and contributions come uh, from the anal uh, my uh, effort to analyze many reports and many proposals that have been, that have been produced on the post-pandemic uh, recovery. And uh, finally, thank you so much for your precious attention to my, to my speech. Thank you so much. Joan, please. Thank you, Paulo. That's great. Thank you, uh, Elena. Thank you, uh, Gabriela, for organizing and facilitating this, uh, this roundtable. It's a pleasure to be here with all of these uh, great fellow panelists. I want to, in my presentation, I want to do two things. Firstly, I want to reflect on, on the meaning of this, uh, this notion of planetary health, which we're all discussing here today. And I want to make the case for, uh, for this concept vis-a-vis um, -vis the limits that I identify in the concept of global health. So Gabriel has already talked a little bit about global health. I want to argue that we need to um, make a paradigm shift to thinking about uh, health matters and health policies in terms of planetary health, given the, um, the limits of this notion of global health, which I will explain in a minute. And the second thing I want to do in this presentation is to reflect about uh, the place of security in this turn to planetary health. There's been a lot of talk, uh, particularly in recent months, uh, regarding uh, securitization of disease, regarding health security. Obviously, the concept of health security is not new. But I want to make the case that uh, security can potentially play, or health security can potentially play an important role in uh, discussions about planetary health. So uh, beginning with my first uh, first point of my presentation, I want to um, argue that the, um, the transition with that I make the case for, the transition from a vocabulary of global health to uh, the paradigm of planetary health is markedly different from the earlier shift that occurred in the history uh, um, of health from international health to global health. In other words, I think that planetary health or thinking through the lens of planetary health places challenges and demands that are more urgent and are more encompassing than what occurred some decades ago with the shift towards global health. 
Uh, just to kind of briefly remind the emergence of global health of, of, of the, the, this idea that health is a global phenomenon that should be addressed in a global way signaled uh, a growing recognition of interdependence on the one hand and at the same time a, a, a growing network of governance mechanisms uh, at international stage that were exemplified from the transition from the international sanitary conferences in the 19 uh, uh, hundreds and the early tw uh, 20th century to the network of global health governance that we see today with the WHO and many other uh, global health actors. I think that global health, and this is me already discussing some of what I perceive, and I need to do this very briefly, obviously, for, for questions of time, but um, global health for me has important limitations. It is still connected with a worldview according to which and I'm quoting here, diseases know no borders. And this idea that we're all united, all on the same boat, united by contagion, which uh, although superficially appealing, this vision is actually very misleading uh, in that it suggests a harmony of interests and an equality of conditions that does not exist in practice. And I think Paulo's presentation already uh, underlined this very well. There is, There are profound inequalities in health. So this idea that we're all in this together, that disease is no, no board as well, I think it's, it's profoundly misleading. And I think global health, uh, to a great extent, global health narratives are still very much tied to this view that we are somehow united in this. Uh, I think the second limitation of the concept of global health is that uh, global health is still tied to a limited view according to which health policies can be addressed by fixing gaps, fixing insufficiencies in existing global health governance mechanism or in the global health governance architecture, be it through better regulation or new and improved institutions. And, 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 and Gabriella's introduction already touched upon this point. And, and I think, and I agree with her that addressing health problems goes much further than fixing and tinkering around the edges of the, our existing uh, health governance mechanisms. So I think that planetary health, the concept of planetary health is, is actually very, very, very uh, places a, a profound challenge for us for thinking and doing, I think, a, a very strong paradigm shift in the way we approach health matters. And I think first and foremost, uh, according to this idea of planetary health, health problems and the definition of public policies to respond to these health problems um, cannot be separated from the current ecological emergency that we are facing. And uh, when, I'm, when I talk about ecological emergency, I'm, I mean something more than not simply climate emergency. There's all these other problems which follow already uh, underlined questions connected with bio loss of biodiversity, the destruction of habitats, uh, problems of, 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 uh, of food security, etc. It's not simply also an environmental emergency in the strictest sense of the word. I think we're, too, we're dealing with an ecological emergency that includes an emergency or a profound crisis of human systems and of socioeconomic organization of the way in which human life is, is managed and is, is, is conceived in the world today. So this emergency, this ecological emergency that I'm talking about stems from capitalism, stems from its associated dynamics of destruction and domination. And I think we need to include these dynamics, of these destructive dynamics, when we are talking about health and we're talking about planetary health. By this, by this, uh, these dynamics of destruction and domination that are associated with, with capitalism, I mean the encroachment of private interests into public and global commons. Uh, the new forms of exploitation and dispossession that we are witnessing today, including novel forms of colonialism and slavery. Uh, the patterns of consumption of, and waste that are uh, promoted by capitalism, uh, the way in which capitalism is organized. And the growth of xenophobia, the growth of racism, the growth of uh, misogyny, which are also associated with our socioeconomic organization. So what does the concept of health, of, of planetary health demand from us? As I said, it demands nothing less than a paradigm shift in how we conceive health and disease. I'm going to say two big 
demands, so to speak, that I think are particularly important. First one is analytical. I think we need to change our analytical categories. Analytically, we need to deepen our, what I call here, and I'm, it's, not, it's not my term, but it, I'm just kind of borrowing it from other authors, which is the idea of a syndemic knowledge. So just shifting from uh, uh, focusing on isolated or discrete diseases or health problems and conceiving the uh, health uh, landscape in syndemic terms. And that means fully recognizing the interconnection of health problems, socioeconomic dynamics, and how they impact groups differently. Let me give you some examples of how we need to deepen our syndemic knowledge. For example, recognizing that when we speak of uh, mosquito-borne diseases like uh, uh, Zika, we need to also conceive the way in which these a specific mosquito-borne disease interacts with other uh, uh, mosquito-borne diseases. For example, uh, Zika interacting with diseases like chikungunya or dengue or malaria or yellow fever, and how it inter interacts with patterns of travel and reproduction of mosquito populations. When we're talking about COVID-19, we need to think about the way in which the current COVID-19 pandemic is being reproduced and it runs the risk of extending further because of the birth of new variants, which in turn are connected with uh, socioeconomic patterns of socioeconomic behavior by governmental decisions, actions or omissions. So the idea that we don't have one single pandemic at the moment, we have an ecology of uh, different variants of COVID-19 that are interacting uh, with each other and that are reinforcing each other and that may be thwarting uh, some of our of our efforts of containment of the disease. I think it's important to consider all this endemic scenario. Also the fact, for example, uh, sticking with the COVID-19 example, the way in which COVID-19 has interacted with other health problems, for example, mental health or rise in mental health problems, a rise in domestic violence, violence against women, all of this also needs to be considered. The whole problem of antimicrobial resistance also calls on us the need to consider syndemic knowledge. So how human behave, behavior interacts with the development of viruses, interacts with other biological entities, with other non-human animals to create a scenario of, uh, of health and disease. So I think this is already, there are a lot of authors already, already approaching the scenario in this term, but I think we need to deepen the syndemic approach. So rather than doing a more kind of an epidemiological approach, I would suggest we Obviously, the two are not mutually exclusive, but we also need to supplement our epidemiological knowledge with a syndemic knowledge. And obviously, this syndemic knowledge includes a, histor a historical syndemic. So the how viruses, how the relations between humans and the non-human environment has evolved over time and how this has impacted on, on, um, on patterns of health and disease. So this is what, what I think is our, the great analytical demand that planetary health places on us. The second demand is more normative. And here I think that we need to develop, to deepen our uh, kind of emancipatory knowledge. Um, given that our current predicament is intrinsically tied with dynamics of domination, we need forms of knowledge that directly seek to resist and work to dismantle these dynamics. So normatively, this emancipatory knowledge means a number of uh, issues. And I'm, I'm, I need to be brief here, but I'm happy to, to, to extend any of this in the, in the discussion and the Q&A. So this emancipatory knowledge needs to include a strong decolonial dimension. So we're still shaped profoundly by patterns of colonialism and neocolonialism. Some of them are uh, overt, others are more implicit and surreptitious. So our knowledge needs to work to decolonize our belief systems, our, our epist ep uh, epistemological uh, systems as well. It needs to be a feminist and non-binary knowledge as well. So recognizing the diversity of experiences, recognizing the way in which the world is still, and global health, is still very much structured by patriarchy. We need, and here I'm borrowing um, uh, the, the words uh, uh, by Pope Francis on his uh, encyclical letter, uh, Laudato Si, from 2015, when he talks about uh, an integral ecology. So an ecology that includes how 
human beings are interacting with each other, how human beings are interacting with their lived environment, and that calls for the, uh, the reinforcement of solidarity and subsidiarity in how we respond to these challenges particularly taking into account the greater responsibilities that come for those who are privileged, for those who are uh, in positions of power. And this obviously needs to include an ecology of everyday life and, and changes in uh, individual and communal behavior. So moving on to the second part of my presentation, I'm going to be very brief. No worries, uh, Elena, I'm not going to uh, take too much time. Um, so security, what role does it play here uh, in this concept of, of, of planetary health? And in, in, in the past, in, in the recent past, we've been very much used to thinking of security in terms of global health um, when, by using the word securitization. And securitization has become very popular to the point that I've grown a, a bit impatient with it. And I think it has important, important uh, limitations. So when we're talking about securitization, and a lot of it has been uh, associated with specific diseases, for example, HIV AIDS, um, avian flu, and more recently COVID-19, we're talking about an approach to health security that is fo focused on urgency and exceptional situations, that is focused on the invoking of existential threat, uh, to justify the bypassing of normal democratic procedure that is based on a threat defense logic, that is based on militarization and uh, on infringements to rights and liberty. So it's, it's the whole scenario in which securitization is normally discussed. Um, and um, I think COVID-19 again emphasized, and again, I can go into more detail this uh, in the Q&A if people want, but I think COVID-19 emphasized again the limits of this vision by showing, for example, how temporary restrictions on liberties are sometimes necessary to save lives. And they have saved lives. And, uh, and the countries that have not put in place these temporary restrictions of liberties, they have lost unnecessarily a huge number of lives. So I think there's important limitations to the securitization uh, concept and securitization narrative. So what I want to suggest and to, to, to wrap up my, my, my presentation is to suggest the concept of health security that is focused not on the exceptional, but that is focused on the everyday, and that it's focused on the demands that the concept of planetary health places on us, which I've just described earlier in my presentation. So we need a concept of health security that takes on board the concrete experiences of real people in real places, instead of emphasizing the exceptional measures that are taken by governments or that, or that the governments fail to, to adopt. We need, a, um, we need a, a, a sense or a concept of health security that sees these concrete experiences of individuals as being connected with syndemic factors and as being connected with planetary dynamics. We need, uh, we need a focus on insecurity as a lift condition and that is experienced differently instead of being something that is ex that, that is lived, that we're all in this together, that is, is the same for everyone. We need a concept of health security that is cognizant of inequalities that seek and that seeks to redress individual and communal vulnerabilities. So that zooms in on these, in, on these uh, specific vulnerabilities that different groups experience in context. We need a concept of health security that privileges the most vulnerable and that places greater responsibilities on the most powerful. And we need a concept of health security that sees health truly as a collective endeavor that is public or that should be seen as a public good, and that uh, a public good that demands and requires uh, uh, participation in decision making as a sine qua non of its, of its effectiveness. So instead of going beyond this kind of fruitless debate between securitization or desecuritization, I think we need to move beyond this, move towards this concept of health security that fully takes on board the challenges that are placed to us by the concept of planetary health. And that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Joan. Very inspiring. Uh, Teresa, please. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night. Uh, Gabriela de Julio, Helena Ribeiro, Deise Ventura, 
Thanks for the invitation to be here. It's an honor and an opportunity. Uh, dear Paulo Buz, how many times? Uh, João Nunes, Patricia Jaime. Well, my objective in these few minutes is to address food systems and their connections to global health and planetary health. I would like to highlight two issues for our debate. Neglected scientific evidence on the impact of current food systems and tech fix solutions that are on the table to transform our food systems. Uh, first of all, the impact of food system on planetary health is alarming. 27% of global forest losses can be attributed to the production of commodities. Food production and consumption is the main cause of biodiversity loss around the planet. It is also responsible for around 30% of greenhouse gas emissions and the consumption of 70% of, of global freshwater reserves and much more. What is disturbing is that this intense an accelerated food production process that has been destroying the planet is not able to feed everyone in a health and sustainable way. Today, the world faces a double burden of malnutrition. Even before the coronavirus pandemic, 2 billion people did not have regular access to health and sufficient food in a world that has the capacity to produce and feed everyone. Among them, almost 800 million were hungry. At the same time, 650 million people were with obesity exposed to diet-related risks. Well, today, probably it's worse. Despite such shocking numbers, the urgent need to reverse today's predatory food systems has been neglected. For example, the debates during last week's climate conference focused in, on energy and transport. Likewise, most countries are proposing actions to address the climate crisis mainly in these two sectors or infrastructure in general. Food appears only marginally in the debate about the Green New Deal, the green transition, or green solution, if at all. I think it matters a great deal to understand why. Secondly, when the impact of food systems on planetary health is addressed, the search for solutions based on high technology has become more, become more and more common and dangerous. Laboratory meat is a good example of this kind of magical solution. In the name of making meat consumption more sustainable, since meat production is the biggest driver of deforestation, lab-grown meat paradoxically increases ultra-processed food consumption. We need to worry about solutions that are based on ultra-processed foods. Good solutions must consider three aspects. First, the precautionary principle which should guide innovations that have unknown consequences. Second, solutions based on high technology put the future of food production in the hands of the big food corporations who are precisely the ones responsible for today's unsustainable hegemonic models. Third, such solutions tend to displace real food I mean, fresh food, freshly prepared meals, and traditional cooking. This causes 
nutritional, social, and cultural disruption, and increase obesity and other diet-related diseases. Here, we are interested in understanding why technology is the easiest, easiest solution when we have some other alternatives. In both cases, I have talked about food system have been secondary, secondary in climate change agenda and UPF, you know, innovations emerge as a solution. One thing stands out that I believe is important to think about. In, uh, it's generally understood that it's easier to promote large centralized interventions based on engineering and technology, even if expensive, than to invest in behavior change and regulating the private sector. The excuse is often the urgent, the, the excuse is often the urgency of planetary issues which require fast solutions. However, the greatest proof that it's possible to change behavior in the short term is the speed, is the speed with which the big food industry itself convinced humanity to choose to eat junk food instead of real food in a few short decades. We should, we should consider whether the same strategy of massive market power in addition, in addition to strong regulations can be used to implement sustainable transformation in food systems. One issue is imperative. Admit that there are good and bad foods that affect our health and environment contrary to what the industry says. Ultra-processed food needs to be recognized and regulated in proportion to the impact they are having on the health and the environment. It's not easy, but it can be done. How Brazil dealt with tobacco consumption is a good example of this. Not to recognize the problem, prevents the advancement of Biden international resolutions. Governments and UN, and UN agencies must stop believing that the food industry will regulate itself and lead the change towards health and sustainable food system. This belief is a kind of denialism. Thanks for... Thanks very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Helena. Thank you very much, Teresa. Also very inspiring. Now I pass to Patricia, please. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Helena. Thanks, Gabriela, for this invitation. It's a great opportunity to participate in this workshop with you and the colleagues uh, that I do admire. So, so from the Brazilian experience, I will briefly explore the role and challenges of public policies for food security in the, global, in the context of global health and planetary health. Uh, the American journalist Mark Beatman stated in his last book, Animal, Vegetable, Junk, that you can't have a serious conversation about food without talking about human rights, climate change, and justice. What a clever and opportunity observation for helping us make connections between food, nutrition, health, sustainability, as important issues for global health and the planetary health agenda. More and more, we have the comprehension of the impossibility of guaranteeing food security, promoting health and sustainable diet, and to prevent and control malnutrition in all its form without talking about food systems, social justice, global health, and sustainability. Food security can be defined as the stable access to adequate and health food for all people at all times. Therefore, 
is in order to promote food security, it's necessary to combine a set of global, national, regional, and local policies and strategies that aims to give everyone, personally and socially, ways of eating well, pay attention to the sustainable use of natural resources, as well as ways of protection of the environment and traditional culinary and gastronomic culture. In order to place Brazil in the global context of nutrition and food security policies, one has to consider that before the multiple crises currently experienced by Brazilian society and the dramatic inflection in public policy observed in the last five years, the country has gained international attention thanks its achievement in reducing hunger and poverty. Brazil has uh, built a robust legal and international uh, institutional framework for food security, transforming the fight against hunger into a state obligation and being flexible to pursue new policies objectives related to preventing obesity and promote a healthy and sustainable diet. Some lessons can be learned from this precautionally interrupted experience. Brazil's political commitment to promote food security rested on the engagement of civil society, intersectorial governance structure, and data and evidence. It has benefited from a long-standing national-wide mobilization that brings together organizations, networks, and so social movements and researchers since the country's democratization in the 80s. Political commitment grew with the election of a popular government that prior prioritized food security in 2002. There was the development of a governance arena for, engage, uh, for engagement between government and civil society that enable the effective coordination, implementation, and monitoring of uh, public policies. Throughout this process, investment and the use of data of public information system and scientific evidence played a key role in such a way that different aspects of malnutrition were considered over time such as food and nutrition security, hunger, breastfeeding, and obesity. As a result, poverty and severe food insecurity were dramatically reduced from 2004 to 2014 in Brazil. In the, on the other hand, new political challenges were emerged on the food security agenda, such as promote changes in the food system to foster health and sustainable dietary practice in agreement with the sustainable development goals. I would like to present a practical example of a policy response uh, for these new challenges, which could be considered as an innovative strategy uh, to the promotion of individual, collective and planetary health. International organizations recognize national dietary guidelines as a potent food security policy instrument to support the reorientation of food system and the control of malnutrition in all its form, including undernutrition, obesity, and dietary risk, which are the leading cause of poor health globally. Dietary guidelines detail the most recent scientific evidence regarding the relationship between diet and health and provide advice on uh, healthy food choices. It can be easily extended to include recommendations on environmentally sustainable diet. They serve as the foundation for actions on nutrition education and are the basis of national policies on food security. Making the scientific knowledge on health and sustainable diet accessible to everyone Everybody is one of the purpose of the road leading dietary guidelines for the Brazilian population published by the Minister of Health in 2014. But, sorry, for uh, 2014. Uh, the central message uh, of this guideline is always prefer fresh and minimally processed food 
and culinary preparation to ultra-processed food. The guide promotes a consumption of health minimally processed food, such as a variety of vegetable foods, reinforces Brazil's staples rice and beans, suggests modest amount of animal foods, and a reduction as much ultra-processed food as possible. It's stated that eating such food in the form of dishes and meals help ensure consuming in a balanced way the nutrients and other bioactive comp uh, compounds that we need to maintain our health and well-being. It also states that the more ultra-processed food are eaten or drunk, the greater the risk of consuming excessive sugar and unhealthy fat and inadequate protein, dietary fiber, vitamins, minerals, and other bioactive compounds. Ultra-processed foods can contain many add additives, which, while used legally, have unknown or uncertain effects on health. Their consumption discourages family farming, decreases biodiversity, threatens natural resources, increases solid waste, and replace genuine food crops. This is publication, the principles and recommendations to the guide have been adopted by the government of other countries, such as Peru, Ecuador, Uruguay, and Israel, and have influenced official food and nutrition policy and programs in Canada, France, and Australia. From a global health perspective, we can assume this phenomenon as a case of policy transfer. The Brazilian diet guidelines have been recognized as one of our emblematic example of a virtual circle of progressively ensuring the human rights to adequate food. However, this challenging political process has been interrupted. Unfortunately, there is a recent worsening on the double uh, burden of malnutrition, hunger and undernutrition, aggravated by obesity due to non health and a sustainable food system. This represents a return to the historical problems of the past century, exacerbated by the new problems of the 21st century. Learning from our past and present successes and failures in radically adopting a planetary health perspective can be a safe and responsible way to resume and straight public policy for food security here and globally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia, very much. And Gabriela, please. Thank you, Elena. It's a great pleasure to be here and to hear my colleagues' fantastic and inspired speeches. Now I'm talking a little bit about climate emergency and the perspective for transition to sustainability. So I'd like to start with the idea that globally, countries, cities, governments, and populations are facing significant risks from climate change. The impacts of this climate change, this phenomenon, have created a number of challenges, including changes in air temperature, precipitation, sea level rise, and increased intensity and frequency of natural hazards. This increases, of course, the frequency and severity of flooding, landslides, heat waves, but also compromise critical services such as electricity, water supply, health, food security, and emergency services. So climate change has been understood as a condition of our time. So as a condition, it means that this phenomenon has serious impacts uh, that interact with and exacerbate other important contradictions in our societies, including socioeconomic inequality, access to goods, services, pollution, loss of biodiversity, access to food and water, human rights, so this is one of the main reasons that in 2019 was declared the year of climate emergency. Declaring a climate emergency is an action taken by government, science, and organizations all over the world to acknowledge humanity is in a climate emergency. The first assertive declaration was made in December 2016, and since then, 
over almost uh, 2,000 deserts shown in 34 countries have declared a climate emergency. The increase in social and environmental vulnerability to extreme climatic events and the aggravation of environmental and social problems has placed climate change as an urgent challenge for decision makers and societies. So from the global health perspective, it's critical to consider the synergy between climate change with other severe crises that characterize modern societies, including the loss of biodiversity, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the institutional trust and the responsibility crisis. It is also critical to understand the interdependency between health, economic development, environmental degradation, governance, human rights, and provide the analysis that uh, shed light on some interactions between policy norms, regulatory frameworks, collective actions, individual perspectives, seeking to understand the cumulative, but also the synergistic effects of critical factors on the, amplifi the amplification of vulnerability conditions. So in this sense, in this panel, I'd like to call our attention to two critical issues regarding climate emergency. The first is the global local interactions of this phenomenon. And the second is uh, the critical perspective of sustainability and how this critical perspective could be a, a path to promote changes for a more adapted future. Regarding the global local interaction, last week during the leaders' summit on climate, uh, the US President Joe Biden declared that we are in the decisive decade for tackling climate change. So international governments along with the summit announced their commitments to reduce emissions, which are closely related to green economy efforts, concrete and immediate actions regarding deforestation, but also lifestyle changes. Besides the necessary countries mitigation efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, there is also a pressing need to advance the status of adaptation planning and interventions at the local level, I mean cities, urban areas, where most people actually live and has been affected by climate impact. But let's keep in mind that adaptation is part of a social environment political process which is closely dependent on the willingness to undertake adaptive measures, the availability and the ability to deploy resources, and the arrangement of conditions that facilitate or hand the consolidation of initiatives. As all local governments, uh, municipal uh, actors, are not the only actors who can lead and deliver adaptation actions, we can assume that effective adaptation planning in urban areas is closely dependent on municipal efforts. So uh, this assumption is even more real in the context of large cities in Global South, like Brazilian cities, which are characterized by globalization, by a competitive urbanism and austerity measures, where we observe the rise of powerful regimes and interested groups that make achieving sustainable adaptation even more difficult. But while cities are responsible for high sources of greenhouse gas emissions, they also play an important role in dealing with the climate crisis, in accelerating changes regarding land use, uh, urban space management, and in joint efforts to push lifestyle changes. For this reason, we can assume that cities are critical locus for experimentations, for testing new solutions, implementing strategies to tackle climate change. In Brazil, um, more than 80% of the population lives in urban environments. So we can say that cities can play a leading role in the climate change governance. However, also Brazil has invested in the past, some efforts to integrate the climate issue into policies, guidelines. The country still plays a very conservative role in this issue, and few Brazilian cities have already incorporated climate change into their agendas. Our recent studies focused on Brazilian cities, on big Brazilian cities, uh, and climate change have shown that while cognitive factors, I mean risk perception, sense of urgency, uh, resources, organizational elements are important to implement transformation and conduct proactive adaptation actions. The real inter interdependency among the climate change with its risks, vulnerabilities, uncertainty, science, denial, 
uh, the dynamics of urban planning and the political issues have been determinant to negatively affect the ability of the cities to consolidate adaptation process. The second aspect that I'd like to bring to this panel is the urgent need to clarify our understand of and commitment with sustainability. If there is one important learning from this crisis that has affected us, the climate emergency, the COVID-19 pandemic, is the urgency of adopting a critical perspective of sustainability, which really strengthens transformative pathways by a new path capable of abandoning the political, social, and economic New Deal. So this understanding of sustainability, which includes, among other critical factors, solidarity and shared responsibility for the planetary resources, human rights, a revised production and consumption models, from uh, my point of view, is crucial to reshape how we tackle climate change. So the studies released to data leave no doubt. There is a single species that is responsible for this crisis and for the enormous planetary challenge brought by the Anthropocene. Us, and as João mentioned before, the capitalism system. So these crises are direct consequences of human activity, including deforestation, uncontrolled uncont expansion of agriculture, uh, intensive farming, mining, infrastructure development, so dealing with this crisis requires uh, concrete efforts to ensure the strengthening and enforcement of environmental regulations, stimulus packages that offer uh, incentives for more sustainable and major positive activities, funding health systems, and of course, incentivize behavior change, which means rethinking the way that we, human beings, interact with other species, with the planet. So this explains why a critical perspective of sustainability is so important. Uh, this agenda of sustainability means inclusion, justice, awareness of differences, and the reconsideration of uh, economic models based on growth, consumption, and waste. So I finish my speech uh, in this panel calling our attention for the potential of global health field. Um, the critical perspectives of global health, and of course, I'm talking about this uh, perspective of uh, paradigm shift that Jean mentioned in his speech, could shed light on some critical aspects to our understanding of cumulative and the synergistic causes of the global crisis, including climate emergence, and the, uh, the effects of this crisis on human rights, on migration, and on food security, as Patricia and Teresa mentioned before. So through a transdisciplinary research agenda aimed to practical solutions focused on integrated actions for diminishing human vulnerability conditions, the global health uh, field could help us to develop a collective reflection viable paths to promote real change and transformations for a more sustainable equitable and adaptive and adaptive future the question is do you want to do this thank you so much thank you gabriella well uh now it's my turn my turn uh, among the sustainable development goals i'm going back now to paula's talk uh, goal three is health and well-being for all ages uh, but in order to uh, achieve this goal, it's necessary to define what well-being is in the course of life. And the wellness concept encompasses multiple meanings from the individual feelings uh, to the sphere of external conditions as adequate uh, sanitation, drinking water, energy, mobility, uh, access to culture, to health services, to education, and a stable uh, social conditions and accessible justice. But on top of that uh, external conditions, well-being is based on the physical, mental and spiritual equilibrium. So in this workshop, I chose to focus on the nature-based solutions and green infrastructure and 
and mental health benefits as a potential tool for the integration of global and planetary health. Lately, there's a body of literature and research pointing to the benefits for mental health of living with nature. The papers highlight overall the role of vegetated surfaces, which has ties to biodiversity, climate change mitigation, and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. There is a long history of literature pointing the need to preserve the natural and improve the urban environment with green spaces as parks, square, tree planting in streets, in order to improve climate conditions, conditions, wellness and health of inhabitants. The pioneer writings are from romantic writers from the 18th and 19th centuries who recognize the organic relation between natural environment and human beings as Rousseau and Thoreau. The famous North American naturalist John Weir was greatly responsible for the creation of the first national park in the world, Yellowstone, in 1872. The rationale behind his struggle was that, uh, quoting, nature is a need and parks and reserves in mountains are useful, not only as source of food and rivers, but as, as source of life. John Muir, 1890. In Brazil, the first national park, Itatiaia, became law in 1937. There are consolidated findings that biodiversity from forests and natural ecosystems provide many benefits. Jolly and Queiroz, 2020, highlight that there are few publications relating biodiversity, the COVID-19 pandemic and human well-being. Scientists have shown the intrinsic relationship of the virus outbreak to biodiversity. Another point is the importance of biodiversity for healing. Uh, Jolie and Queiroz uh, point that over 40% of all medical drugs and 70% of those used as antibiotics and anti-cancer have origin on biodiversity. Biodiversity is also used in drug against thrombus, microbes, and viruses. However, the development of antiviral uh, viral drugs for new diseases is complex, expensive, and demands solid scientific investigation. Finally, ecosystem services provided by natural vegetation are important drivers to minimize climate change but are at serious risk under accelerated deforestation and changes in land use. Thus, it's urgent that action taken by government and population against COVID-19 pandemic and to minimize its effects do not amplify the risks of future disease outbreaks and crises. Returning to the focus on the use of natural areas for benefiting mental health. In search of some theoretical literature on the team, I came across Glickson. Already in the mid 20th century, Glickson wrote that it was possible to assume that man has a biological urge to change his environment. According to him, to come in touch with different types of environment belongs probably to the same category of desires of the physical demand for a variegated nutrition and the physical demand for a variegated social context. However, urban man has little chance to exercise this ability. In his view, a modern urbanite might be considered undernourished in respect to environment. 
And this is among the motives behind recreational mobility. Change in environment is a need felt in all the temporal frameworks of life. Times during the day, the day itself, the week, the yearly seasons and lifetimes. Each of these periods can be related to some spaces, as the family house and schools to serve recreational needs during parts of the day. The public gardens, squares, playgrounds, amusement and cultural centers for daily and some weekly recreational needs. And the city surroundings with parks, forests, rivers, for weekends and vacations at different seasons of the year. Recreational areas in and around cities are important for physical health and mental equilibrium and are socially essential as they are the places where community bonds are formed during leisure time. Cox and Tao 1917 affirms that the growing problem of depression, anxiety, and stress has, at least in part, been attributed to the increasing disconnect between people and the natural world. Research shows that interactions with nature promote psychological restoration, improved mood, improved attention, and reduce stress and anxiety. Framkin in 2020 analyzed many articles on the role of nature-based solutions for mental health problems, including a therapeutic role for people who suffered brain accidents, and as an important tool to diminish violence and crime in overcrowded neighborhoods. Slums are characterized by lack of space and obsoleteness of flats and houses, but also by hordes of children and adults escaping their dwellings in and filling streets. Since they do not meet in properly dimensioned squares and gardens, but instead are compressed in narrow streets or yards, the nearness of one to another stimulates friction, quarrels, and hate among them. Glickson is a quote. A slum quarter, therefore, requires large public gardens and squares for public facilities. Town dwellers in better economic conditions, on the other hand, constitute a nuisance or even a problem for the countryside. One can highlight that nature recreational use has received a large surge during the COVID-19 pandemic. This has a relation first to home office, which became viable for some category of workers, uh, mainly uh, with high income. Second, to the desire to get away from crowded cities and from higher risk of contagious. Just to mention an example, Data app, a real estate app registered in the state of Sao Paulo from February 2020 to February 2021, an increase of 154% in demand for properties in the interior of the state a 47% increase at beach site and a decline of 9% of demand in the capital city. This phenomenon was registered in other world cities as New York and outskirts. This migration of people and also of enterprises at first might, might look as a very positive return to nature and a downsizing of urban areas. But its planetary health effects have to be studied carefully in its full complexity. In an attempt to acquire 
mental health, wellness, mental wellness, there has been a rediscovery of landscape. But pressure of vacationers on the remaining rural and wildlife places destroys these places as true resources of restful recreation. The biggest threat, in my view, is the uh, is a, a neologism, alphavilization of the countryside. That is, the opening of large condominiums and resorts on rural areas in wildlife areas, transforming the natural environment, destroying biodiversity, and pushing agricultural activities to forested areas or to farther less fertile soils, where there is need of more chemical products for maintaining productivity and for more fossil fuel for transport. Nowhere should recreation be an exclusive function of an area. A landscape should be useful and beautiful at the same time, a resource of life and its renewal. And also there is a need of reconstruction of landscape, increasing forests and Buddha strips, intensification and variegation of agricultural land use according to soil capabilities, and a far-reaching reorganization of the treeless food factories or of the eroded soils. And that's, thank you very much, just to, to put these ideas in discussion for all of you. So now we, we ended the, the presentations. We open this space to discussion among us and we will receive a question by the chat only because it was impossible to open discussion with all the public. So, word is open for all of you. Mm -hmm. Elena, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to mention that there are uh, people from different countries that are seeing uh, uh, our webinar this morning. So it's great to see colleagues from different places in Brazil, Denmark, France, uh, Canada, Kenya, uh, Edinburgh, Baltimore, Micronesia, Azerbaijan. So it's great to see how this uh, international uh, webinar is coming. So great. And also we have some comments that uh, I, 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 could, I could read for you. It's OK. Yeah. Um, so uh, David is the very mentioned that uh, Global Health created the new networks, but planetary health breaks silos. So uh, he thinks that the planetary health uh, reached the core of global health, which means globalization is a problem because its impact on the planet as well as on human health obviously is interrelated. Uh, Karini Raid uh, say, great to hear a syndemic approach in the discussion. Breaking down silos is key and highlights the importance of a transdisciplinary, team-based approach to find solutions. Michael Avern said, the elephant is the room is neoliberalism, which has engulfed the planet like a pandemic. Katrick Kivioja, powerful presentation, John loved the focus on equity and the non-binary view of danger. So uh, Liz Grant, uh, so powerful and clear planetary health paradigm shift is essential. Um, and Kira Mack, a very powerful presentation so far, loved every bit of it. So many thanks for the, the comments. Um, I don't know if you have some specific questions for, for us. The floor is open. No. I, I I do like to 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 say something about. Uh, I think the comments are very interesting because uh, they catch the the idea of uh, these uh, the, the essential of our presentations. And thanks so much for this. I think uh, there are many. Uh, let me say many uh, new leaves. I can say uh, in the global scenario, not related, regarding my presentation, not related to uh, the Agenda 25, 2030, as the, with this name, with this strategy. 
But I think uh, the the new administration in the United States by Biden, I think it's a, it's a, it, uh, it marks a difference because we have uh, in the, the one of the most or the most powerful country in the world, the United States. Of course, it's competing with China about the hegemony of, uh, of uh, political and uh, and uh, economic hegemony with China. But uh, we can say this one, that these are um, uh, some new leaves, new green leaves, let me say, because it's quite important this the, uh, the, the United States uh, uh, started these discussions uh, preparing the Glasgow meeting in, in the end of the year. And this is important because it's uh, not mentioning planetary health, not mention uh, Agenda 2030. This is the question, not mention glo global health is mentioned many times because the pandemic is a very important question in global health. But I think this, we, we have to, 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 uh, to, to catch also these, uh, these new movements. Another one is um, the G G20 Summit on Global Health next May, next May 21. I think it's important. And I ask for our participation in this kind of uh, multilateral space, multilateral political space. We, we, are, uh, we are scholars, let me say, but we are also uh, political agents. And uh, and we have it to exert this this function of political uh, of the political actors we are. So I think we have it to define it. We have also the the, the 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 old house assembly in May, in 24th of uh, 24th May, and these are very important uh, uh, um, global. Uh, World arenas, arenas that we have to intervene because our ideas can change some ideas of government, and we have to reinforce uh, social movement positions. I mean, this uh, this meeting, our meeting, this uh, this round table, have to define also some strategies to act in this global arena, in these meetings. And not meetings as meetings, but it's political spaces. I think it's quite important, and we have to define our participation, the participation of each of us. But also as movements, we have been participating. For instance, I'm president of the Latin America Alliance of Global Health, and and in this uh, in this um, uh, position, I. I'm trying to put this organization participating in, in this very important uh, meetings, very important political space that are coming in the next months, in the next uh, period of time. Thanks so much. João, could you discuss a little bit this idea? <laughs> First of uh, all, I, I, I just one? no this this political role we have in taking uh, ahead the ideas we discussed today. Uh, but before that, I, I want to to mention and excuse Professor uh, Eliseu Waldman. He uh, woke up sick this morning. That's why he could not participate in his vision on uh, infectious diseases and relation to biodiversity uh, was a, a loss for us in this discussion. And I hope he gets well, but just to uh, inform the public. Okay, uh, I'll pass the word to you, João, please. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Elena. Um, and thanks everyone for their comments. Um, I think, I think the, 
the issue of politics and the, the role that politics plays in the context of, uh, of what I argue is a, is a or should be a paradigm shift towards a planetary health approach. I think it's 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 a complex one because one of the things that this um, that this pandemic uh, current pandemic COVID nineteen has emphasized is the the fine line that we need to walk in terms of privileging politics. Uh, in our discussions about um, uh, global health responses, uh, and this is because in many, in many, um, in many cases, uh, the public health responses have become to, certain, to some extent, well, to a great extent, politicized, in a way or in a kind of a narrow way, in the sense that they have been instrumentalized for uh, political purposes, very often uh, short-term, myopic political purposes. Um, United States under Trump is a good example. Brazil is a, obviously a, another good example. Uh, but there's all many other examples in, in places where um, the, the pandemic has been used as a justification or as an instrument to uh, further, for example, the oppression of minorities, to disrespect uh, the rights of certain groups in societies. So um, I'm I'm all for recognizing the political dimensions of health. I think uh, pandemics and epidemics and health and disease are profoundly political phenomena. But at the same time, we need to recognize that we are in a situation in which very often um, health has become instrumentalized for uh, for political purposes. And, 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 and this has had a huge detrimental impact on, on, on societies. And obviously I'm not, I'm not even talking about other uh, forms of, uh, of uh, or other kind of more uh, uh, nefarious ways in which this politicization has occurred, uh, for example, in anti-science and pandemic denialism discourses, uh, which are very prevalent in, in, in countries and regions where there is this political instrumentalization, that very often political instrumentalization is supported by denialist discourses, is supported by anti-science denialism and uh, suppression of scientific knowledge and data. So the pro the question of politics is, is, is something that will keep us busy for the next few years, I think, because on the one hand, we want to emphasize that pandemics are the result of political choices. They are not simply biological phenomena. They are the result of political actions and political omissions. Um, I've argued elsewhere that one of the things, and this uh, is a nod to Michael Abrams' comments, I've argued elsewhere that this pandemic is a crisis of neoliberalism. Um, and it reflects the contradictions of neoliberalism. So when we're talking about pandemics like COVID-19, we need to talk about the political choices that had led us here, that had rendered us vulnerable uh, to pandemics such as this one. Uh, so it's about political actions and political emissions. At the same time, we need to uh, defend and fight for um, science, science that is verifiable, science that is, uh, that, 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 that is uh, as impartial as possible and that is put to the service of public health and not instrumentalized for political purposes. Um, I've, I've rambled a bit, Elena. I don't know if I've, I've answered the question. I hope no, so. If fine. not, let me know. No, I want to, to Gabriela, maybe, and Patricia, uh, to discuss a little the, the role of science and of scientific evidence to con uh, the, uh, be a counterpart of this negationism of science and this political uh, position that we see very much widespread in the world nowadays and uh, how the scientists have to have a political role also, need to have a political role uh, to show the results of science and the scientific evidence. It's interesting to think that, as João mentioned, that we need uh, paradigm shifts in terms of global health, planetary health, securitization. I think that we also need a paradigm shift in, uh, in terms of interactions between science uh, and policy and politics. 
Uh, perhaps this is another uh, important uh, lesson, important learning from the COVID-19 situation that uh, for the first time, I would say that most of my colleagues, most of the researchers are really uh, thinking about how we communicate our data, our scientific uh, uh, results to, to politics, to, to the public in general. Uh, we are very concerned about how we uh, how people in general use the scientific information to make their decisions about uh, what they should do uh, to deal with the pandemic to avoid the contagions of the virus or uh, to rethink the way we, we live so it's, uh, it's a very interesting movement of course this is not new but i would say that the and the covid 19 situation and puts um, more uh, emphasis on this um, necessity uh, uh, to, to bring the, the, the interactions, the communications, the interfaces between policy and science to the table. Uh, the, uh, I, I, of course, we need to think about that if we are learning something about this. So first of all, how communicate better what we produce in universities, in research institutions, to the public, to the society. But the second point, uh, from my point of view, which is really important, is how we open the black box, the science of seeing as a black box, to the public. How we uh, uh, give uh, power to the society to be part of this knowledge uh, production. So. Uh, another thing that's very important is to think how can we, uh, in fact, co-produce knowledge that is useful for decision-making process uh, to respond to the needs of the societies, uh, but also to include their demands, their uh, perspectives, their wishes, their desires in terms of a better uh, future. And I, I'm not talking about technology. This is not the point. The point is that uh, the science that we are producing is able to respond to the, uh, the risks that we are producing, the uncertainties that we are creating. I would say that uh, now with the pandemic situation, it's quite clear that the science doesn't have concrete answers for everything. Actually, we have so many uh, lack of information, so many uh, gray areas that we can't uh, respond alone. So perhaps this is the time to listen to, to integrate other knowledge, traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, practical knowledge to uh, better understand how we deal with this uh, crisis, with the global crisis. So um, that's my view, Elena. Well, we have to think also that, that science uh, uh, has a, a political view also, a political position behind scientists. And science can be used for uh, protecting the planet, or science can be used for destroying the planet, as the atomic bomb was built by scientists also, and uh, guns and other uh, destructive equipment are built by scientists also. So there's a, a decision in the individual level that has to be with ethics and with uh, spiritual uh, context also and uh, education and lots of things. And, and in this moment when we uh, like students are very far away from school when uh, the information is got in very short uh, messages in the internet how those uh, ideas and those feelings and those uh, more uh, substantial uh, discussion can be uh, introduced in education and in society like this ethical points and this uh, social uh, aspects that are behind uh, problems uh, and solutions 
I don't know if anyone wants to mention anything about this thing. Elena, we have a very good question. I would say very connected to your point uh, from Katri Kivioja. She's asking us, um, where do you go from here? We all recognize the need for interdisciplinary work and multi-stakeholder -stake action, but how do you make that happen? What needs to be in place for marginalized voices to truly be heard and not in a tokenistic manner? Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> uh, Paulo, do you want to? I'm very concerned uh, with some uh, question raised by Gabriela, and I'm uh, reading here in the in, in the chat also. Uh, Michael Abrams uh, said that science is always political and has been since Galileo. His he mind our uh, the, the old Galileo and the question of. Uh, science and uh, religion, etc., etc. I think it's important to identify, I insist in this one, political uh, spaces to act. And we have to recognize that, for instance, G20 is a set of very important countries, and there will be, uh, in May 21, a meeting uh, on a uh, summit on global health. And we have to organize our intervention in these spaces. Because we have some ideas, we have uh, theses, we have uh, uh, political positions based in our uh, approach, of our social sciences approach of the end, the planetary health and the global health approach of the COVID-19 situation but this is immersed in a in a in a more um in a more in a broad environment political environment scientific environment etc etc so i think we have to define this this um this um, key political spaces where political <coughs> leaders are deciding on our behalf you know i think we have to influence the participants, influence the, 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 the participants, and we have to participate in these political spaces. I don't know, I, I'm part of the World Federation of Public Health Associations, for instance. I was, I am a former president, past president of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. And I'm insisting, and uh, uh, the World Federation is preparing statements to put the, the ideas of the, 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 the doctors and nurses, etc., working in uh, public health in the WHA, in the World Health Assembly, and also in the, the G20 summit, trying to influence the declarations, influence the statements, influence the actions that will come from these meetings and this i think this, we are in a in a in a in a very important moment of the world because all the world is all the people in the world is influenced by this uh, tragedy that is a, 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 a health problem a health tragedy and we have to to inform the public we have to 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 discuss with politicians which is the, the, the which the deep root of this pandemic and the next pandemics and we have to say about the transformation of environment the bad bad policies uh, on on uh, environment the bad policies on social uh, conditions the bad policies of uh, uh, economic situation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and I think these these um, connections among uh, among uh, uh, several uh, policies, it's a syndemic situation. That, let me insist in this concept raised by João, for instance. Syndemic is not only uh, related to health, the health situation, but also, also uh, 
uh, connecting health with social, economic, and environmental situations. This is endemic also. And we have to, to, to try to convince these politicians that will decide the destiny of our countries and uh, the multilateralism, etc. And I think we have to define how to influence these people to go ahead differently, because the past is the past. The past, it's the, 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 the development model brings our, uh, brought our, ourselves to the situation we have living now. And we have to transform the situation because the future, we can have many other, not only pandemic, but uh, many other situations, many other healthy situations that uh, will deny our, our, the, 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 the destiny of the, the, the humankind. So I think we have to try to convince using our institutions. I don't know, because I think all of us uh, belong to uh, as part of uh, many institutions. And I think we have to prepare statements, positions to discuss in these political spaces, because the decisions will be there. The decisions will be the, 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 the stage of the world is, will, def, will be defined in these multilateral political spaces. It's my opinion, and I will try and to do my best. I don't know if you yeah, can. Yeah, I know. But, well, let's try to, to, to... The good will is the most important, indeed. Uh -huh. João, would you like to react to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, uh, I, I mean, I totally agree with with Paulo. I think, um, uh, I think one of the one of the the main main problems that the world is facing today uh, is the retreat of multilateralism. We have a crisis of multilateralism that um, that uh, is impacting upon the world's ability to coordinate a response and the. COVID-19 is, is, is again emphasizing how disastrous uh, for the planet is this retreat of multilateralism and, and, and the crisis of, uh, of uh, international institutions like the WHO, which is, which is a crisis that has been in the making for many years, unfortunately. We've had uh, a growth in, in nativism, a growth in nationalisms, uh, which is also detrimental and that can prove uh, very, very, or highly detrimental to uh, successfully responding um, to the pandemic in a way that saves lives. So I think count many lives are being unnecessarily lost because of the difficulties in, 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 in finding a coordinated response at the international level. Um, so um, just kind of very briefly, if I may, uh, respond to a comment by, by Tiago. Tiago Lima mentioned that it's impossible to make the great transition and stay with capitalism or neoliberalism. We have to move forward. Well, um, maybe, yes. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I didn't want to go so far as to say that we got, we have to get rid of, of capitalism and neoliberalism. I think definitely we shouldn't wait for that in order to take action because uh, capitalism and neoliberalism, after all, are uh, reproduced in the everyday. They are reproduced in our everyday decisions of uh, uh, our choices in consumption, uh, our choices in who we vote for, our choices in uh, 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 how we deal with, uh, with, with with questions of how how much of the uh, the planet's resources we use and the waste that we that we produce and all that. So um, you know, capitalism exists because we act as if it exists. Ultimately, obviously, there are capitalist structures that are very powerful and that determine in our actions, but they can also be challenged, they can be resisted, but they can be even be subverted in the everyday. So I'm, I, 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 I'm optimistic. I mean, I'm normally not very optimistic in, in matters in general, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about the power of everyday life to, to an everyday decisions of groups and individuals to change 
uh, structures from within. So I wouldn't say that, you know, let's first get rid of capitalism and then let's deal with the planetary emergency because we can, you know, the world cannot wait, the planet cannot wait. We need to fix the planetary emergency by working and by seeking to resist and subvert the structures in our everyday lives. Um, I've also tried to address in, in, in the comments uh, my uh, some of the points raised by Katri, uh, which very rightly pointed out the dangers of tokenism when seeking to bring in traditionally neglected, traditionally marginalized voices. I'm totally, I, I think, I'm to I totally agree with your with your view, Katri. I think yes, it is a, a great risk, and it's important that the um, that these voices, particularly non-academic voices, voices from other uh, stakeholders in societies and communities are given equal standing in our debates. So we need to really need to change the way uh, politics is done ultimately uh, in terms of how representation, how participation is encouraged and how participation is fostered in decision making. And, um, you know, we, we haven't done a great job in terms of fostering this kind of participation and decision making uh, at, the, at the global level. And I think we need that this needs to change if we are to avoid these uh, these dangers of tokenism. So thanks for bringing that. Gabriela, you are the one in the communication. <laughs> field, please. I want to hear you. Yeah, so first of all, I'd like to thank Daniela Viana. She is one of the organizers of this meeting and she is attending our panel. So thanks. It's great to see you here, Daniela. So, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with the point is that João uh, and Paulo uh, brought to, to us to reflect about the, the, uh, the role of politics and how we need to uh, be more in, in context to, to better interact with politicians. But also, I, I, I like this point that, uh, that João brought that, uh, okay, science is important. Uh, of course, most of the time, especially here in Brazil, we need to say to politicians that we have scientific evidences to uh, uh, to improve the decisions uh, to how uh, deal with uh, COVID-19 situation or to deal with the problem of deforestation, to tackle climate change. But also there are uh, other voices that's really important that perhaps this is a, a, an important task for us as scientists, as research, to bring their voice to, to, to the table. Uh, so uh, it's a big challenge because most of the time I don't think that we are so ready for this in terms of uh, how science mainstream in general works. Uh, but this is a, 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 an important role for us to, to give uh, uh, space, to give visibility to uh, voices from indigenous people, traditional people, vulnerable people who, has, who have their own way to adapt to climate change, their own way to adapt to the global crisis, their own way to, con to be more connected to, to the nature. Uh, so, uh, for example, if you think uh, about your talk and you're saying that people, perhaps this is a good moment to reconnect people with nature and to thinking about the importance of ecosystem services uh, to our health, to our mental health. But again, there is, uh, um, I, I totally agree with this, but I, I would say that this could be a movement that's quite clear for uh, rich people or for people who are in the better conditions. I, I, I was wondering if we can think about how to connect people to environment, if you're thinking about vulnerability, if you're thinking about uh, social economic inequalities, uh, if you're thinking about part, uh, significant parts of the Brazilian society who are so far from this. So this is, again, a huge uh, task for us as scientists, as researchers who are thinking about uh, the interactions between environment, health, society, policy, politics. I'd like to, to we have just one minute, two minutes, but to, to point to the, the role of uh, 
youngsters. One can see that youngsters have been the weak uh, of this chain, the weak, and they have the one that are mostly at risk, not only because they, the school system is uh, very well, very badly organized for giving them a good education, but because the highest rate of unemployment is among youngsters and also among those who just got a degree. They cannot find jobs and even if they have studied and uh, how we can uh, engage them in this fight for a good, a better planet since they are the ones that are going to live in this planet for a longer time. I don't know if you, we can discuss this because there is very little uh, discussion on this and on bringing them to the workshops and seminars and uh, to hear their opinion also. Well, I think, uh, Elena, just very quickly, one of the most heartening things that I've witnessed is that in many cases, the younger generations are leading the way. They are already mobilizing. They are already doing things. And they are already setting, the, in many respects, they are already setting the terms of the agenda. So um, I agree that we need to listen more. We, uh, not so young people, uh, need to listen uh, more to the new generations, which are, after all, the generations who are going to feel the impact more decisively uh, and that will, their lives are going to be more decisively uh, impacted by the current emergency that we're facing. But what's heartening to see, for me at least, is that um, you know young people are aware of what's happening. They are mobilizing. They are, uh, I think, pressuring governments, they are uh, already uh, showing great ability to uh, engage with both traditional and non-traditional uh, uh, spheres of politics. Uh, I think uh, it would be great if we could also in our own fora, such as this one, which are traditionally academic and, 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 and a conference such as this are traditionally fora for grown-ups. Um, uh, and I think we need to probably rethink the ways in which we need to also bring in and listen more uh, to what they have to say, uh, the, 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 the younger generations. And I think it's an important listening exercise that we not so young need to do. Yeah, I think I agree with you that a, a large part of the youngsters are involved in the, the discussions and leading the ways, mainly in Europe or even in the United States, but in low and middle income countries the large majority of youngsters are trying to survive and to find a, a way of life and uh, to find jobs and to to find their future. So I think that's uh, we, a point we have to think about. I think we are over time already. I don't know, Gabriela, you want, I pass the word to you if you want to uh, say something and, and do Paulo and Juan before we, we close up. Yeah, so I, I would like to thank you again. It was a great pleasure to organize this workshop with Elena and Daisy and to listen to my colleagues, to learn a lot, a lot about uh, health planetary, planetary health, global health, and how we can uh, go further in the reflections about sustainability, about new ways of life, the reconnections between human beings and the planet and the nature. So uh, it's great to, to see many colleagues here attending this workshop, their comments, their support. It was great. So thank you so much for this opportunity. It was great. Yeah, I, I had a, a, a very nice morning. I learned a lot from you and from the comments of the people in the, in the chat. Because many, many interventions uh, in the chat were great. And thanks so much for this wonderful morning. I learned a lot from João, Gabriela, you, Helena, and uh, the, 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 the other participants. And um, 
maybe my final message is uh, we have to uh, to 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 hope uh, we have to have hope we have to to have good will and we have to define uh, precise movements uh pol political movements because we have to use our knowledge our science to transform the world i'm very positivist in this sense and mm -hmm. uh, like joan said i'm um uh I'm critical, but I'm optimist. I think. I mean, I think there are many people engaged, like uh, all of us, in in in, in compromise uh, to transform the world in a in a good way, in a for a, a, a better situation. But I think we have not be ingenuous. There are many political forces acting against our the, the, this kind of vision we have and uh, we have um we have uh, allied and we have non-allied so i mean we have to understand the political situation in each day in each action we have uh identifying the 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 that find the the allied the alliance the allied and the non-allied and not being generous but you have to be optimist. It's my my final uh, intervention. Let me say, and thank you so much for this this excellent morning where I, I have I learned a lot from you and from the the chat. Thanks so much. Good morning. Good afternoon. Oh, Paulo, we always learn a lot with you. Thank you very much for your words. And João, would you like to say your last words? Just saying thank you again to Orga for organizing this. Your yeah, microphone thanks. is closed. Uh. Uh, thanks again for organizing this and thanks for such a wonderful uh, audience who was so engaging with so many very interesting questions. It, it was a pleasure for me and hope we may continue this discussion in future opportunities. Okay, and Gabriela want to say something? Okay, and thank you very much.